I'm your host, Cus. Dan's also hosting, Michael, as well. And today we have invited some, a few Edutari community members into the interval to discuss their experience thus far after joining the community, this community of practice. Uh, today we're also thankful to have Craig from Solve Next. Uh, where Solve Next's mission is to create positive social, economic, and environmental impact by enabling organizations everywhere to imagine, build, and operate status quo busting solutions, which I just love that. So welcome. Yes, and welcome everybody. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, wherever it is you are. But uh, first, a little bit about uh, why we're here, uh, who we are. Agitari is a community built of facilitators from across the national security and defense sectors who employ facilitated discovery, problem solving, team building, and design frameworks to enhance their innovation transformation and mission efforts of their units, offices, or organizations. We want to normalize facilitated discovery and design frameworks in policy and workforce decisions in national security by providing a venue for once isolated innovators and enablers to build a community of practice uh, to find and share support with each other and motivation and improve their craft. Uh, the core team of Agitari has assembled our per and pursues our mission, which is guided by our values, uh, which are foster a growth mindset, stay curious, act with empathy, demand inclusivity, and do the work deliberately. If you're not currently in the Agitari community, we invite you to please join us on Slack where most of our interactions take place. Uh, we will drop a, a link to join that in the chat. Uh, and if uh, you can't see the chat, if you're on a replay, feel free to check us out at agitari.def.org. All right, so I, I think looking at all the participants, most of you are pretty familiar with Fishbowl and the community, but today we just wanted to highlight some uh, the experience of some of our community members. So we're going to be talking with Greg today about Solve Next and Think Wrong. And uh, we're just really excited to have him. Uh, Philip, Jordan, Chloe, and Andrew have recently gone through the Think Wrong intensive. So we will be discussing their experience specifically. All right. Well, Greg, welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, we are excited. To, to talk about Solve Next. I mean, I've just been diving deep into everything you have to offer online. I just listened to um, the great podcast that you did with on the Invincible Innovation Show uh, with Addy, and I'm just a big fan. And so thank you for being here. Could you please uh, introduce yourself and talk about Solve Next for a little bit? All right, um, well, thanks. And it's good to see familiar faces. Uh, went through the intensive recently and some longer ago, Daniel. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Solve Next. We are, we don't really exactly know how to describe um, who we are and what we do and, and, and why it matters very articulately, but we're essentially an innovation firm. Um, our, we help organizations in three different ways. Historically, we were called in to help uh, organizations who are stuck working on a hard uh, problem and they wanted help looking at that problem in a new way. And we have a, a, a problem solving methodology that we refer to as thinking wrong. And we would, we would basically design and run um, intensive sessions around challenges that, that those client organizations had. So that, that was kind of how we got our start. Um, what, what, uh, in 2016, we wrote a book called Think Wrong and uh, started getting that in the hands of various folks and they wanted, they had expressed interest in developing the, the skills and having an uh, opportunity to practice thinking wrong themselves. So we started um, offering some training in the methodology and simultaneously we have, were developing a piece of software really to, to run our own business. Uh, and we called it the Think Wrong Lab. And we use that to um, just make our operation more efficient. And what, what ended up happening is, is clients started looking over our shoulder and saying, hey, we'd, we'd like to be able to use that software as well. Uh, could we have access to it? So we thought, well, that sounds like a business. We've got clients asking for something. Maybe we could sell them uh, memberships into that. And uh, we, so we, so we, uh, we all opened up the software for external uh, folks to use at, at, at the same time. So we, we, we kind of went to market in three ways. We would um, deliver services, we would deliver training, and we would deliver software. And er, 
early on, in fact, in the in the very first um, cohort that we had, we made a commitment to um, reserve four spots uh, in every class that we taught uh, and make them available on a scholarship basis to either active duty uh, reservists or, or uh, spouses of, of folks who have been in the military. So we're looking at somebody who's uh, in the reserve, somebody who's active, a veteran or, or a spouse and, and make that available. And we've done that through, throughout, um, through really since 2016, since we first started offering the classes. And um, the, uh, the Ajitari folks uh, were kind enough to say, hey, would you like to have us take the administration of the scholarship program off your hands? Uh, and we said, oh, yes, please, <laughs> hey, you know, you know, the community better. You have people showing up saying they want to be, a, uh, they, they want to have access to the training. Um, so that's been a, a really fantastic, um, you know, offer on your part and, and benefit to us in terms of getting, getting folks to, to sign up who are really interested in building their skills uh, as facilitators and are interested in, in all kinds of different problem solving methodologies. I think you know Daniel is probably the the uh, the most curious uh, facilitator I've ever run uh, across in terms of uh, his appetite and interest in in different methodologies. And and we we don't see think wrong as the answer. We just see it as another tool in your kit, right? So that's that's kind of the idea with it. Um, so we were we have been uh, lucky recently. Uh, Chloe and Jordan and Andrew. And Philip went through uh, the, the most recent intensive. Uh, Michael, uh, in, in days past, as, as well as Daniel, had been through it also. Um, and, uh, you know, it's always a fantastic opportunity for us to have, we, we get people from every sector, uh, but it's, it's always fantastic for us to have uh, people who are in the military to uh, engage with people who are not. Right? It's eye opening for everybody, I think. So um, it's good to have that. It's good to have that mix. Um, the what what we in our most recent kind of incarnation, and we're 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 constantly evolving, constantly learning, and and trying to improve what we do. In the most recent uh, incarnation of our business, we. Um, have really been focused on helping organizations establish systems of innovation. And that sounds a little um, contradictory to the way that I think a lot of people think about creativity and design and innovation. They think of that as being, you know, something that shouldn't have any rules, should just be free form and, you know, don't, don't sort of cramp my style as a creative person by trying to impose rules or discipline on it. Uh, where in fact it, it's those constraints and those those systems that make the um, make it possible to repeatedly uh, innovate and create new things and to scale those and to um, have the kind of impact uh, that we all seek to have when we're trying to create change. So um, we've for the last couple of years at least been finally trying to answer the question that our clients were asking us, which is, um, hey, we love Think Wrong, we love the methodology. We kind of use it mostly for ideation. Um, and so we want to know what's next. And um, so we, we've been working on helping them solve, <laughs> solve what's next and, and establish those systems uh, that, that look at what's it like to be on a team that's innovating, what's it like to run a team that's innovating, and what's it like to be a leader who has to make decisions about where and, and how and when we allocate uh, resource and when we stop, right? <laughs> Big, big part of innovating is knowing, to, knowing when to stop as well. So that's, that's a little bit of background about um, Solve Next. Just personally, I'm a, um, by training, I'm a designer. Uh, I, I, went to, I went to art school, <laughs> so, you know, uh, many years ago. Um, I love to draw and, and, uh, and, and went to art school and discovered that what I don't want to do for a living is draw <laughs> because everybody who did that for a living was really depressed and nearly suicidal. So I was like, yeah, no, that's a, that seems like a bad mental health path to go down. Um, so uh, in, instead, uh, I, I pursued design and design has this nice mix of creativity and, 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 um, and uh, uh, I'd say discipline, but really there, there's science behind it. You can sort of understand what does work and what doesn't work. Uh, and you can measure it and you can, and you can build on that. So, so that's, sort of, that's, that's how I got started uh, in, in, this, in this work. 
And I've always really been interested in how do you unlock the creativity and ingenuity of, uh, of individuals, especially people who don't necessarily perceive themselves as being that. So I think as facilitators, you probably all get that sort of satisfaction of what happens when you unlock somebody's brain and, and sort of get them over that um, obstacle that they put in their own path and, and get them to start to um, participate in the creation of of solutions that really can't be conceived in another, another way. So that's a big part of the, the work we do and why I keep showing up and doing it. So uh, Gus, that's that's the background. I don't know uh, to what extent you, if, if, if you want me to dive into a more kind of thoughtful presentation of what Think Wrong is about, we can do that. I know ha ha half the group at least knows that, <laughs> so. Yeah, no, no, no. I, uh... Like thinking back, like since 2016, it sounds like you've just you've had so you've had a consistent um, group of military-oriented uh, participants in the Think Wrong intensive, correct? And what kind of uh, interactions have you seen from kind of that group and mixing with um, you know industry and uh, outside agencies that maybe has benefited? those or maybe some of those trends that you've seen in mindsets? Well, uh, you know, I'll, I'll let the, I'll, I'll let the folks on the military side answer that question. <laughs> That's right. They're probably better off to answer it. I mean, I can, what I can observe, I, I'll, I'll, I'll say this, that in general, and this is, a, this is a very, you know, broad generalization, in general, people have a perception of folks in the military that's just ill-informed, right? They don't, they don't really, they, they, they don't really get you know how how diverse and and capable and um, and uh, thoughtful folks in the military are. So there's a sort of general um, I think kind of misperception that is um, really from the civilian side. I, I think it's just like eye opening to see hey these are you know people who are um, you know smart, engaged, uh, doing work that matters um, and um, and dealing with a lot of similar issues, right? It's like, oh, wow, all the complexities of the private sector you can find in the military and all the complexities of the military you can find in the private sector to different degrees, right? The, 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 uh, the, there's, <laughs> there's, there's certain liberties that people in uh, sort of corporate or nonprofit space can take that it's tougher to do in the military. Um, but I think that there's a lot of common ground that's found. That's what I, that's what I've observed is that people are like, wow, you know, these are these people are great. <laughs> I want to be in a room with them. I want to be doing work with them, uh, as opposed to the, the sort of um, I think almost like a tentativeness or a, a, a fear or a, a negative per perception that makes them feel like oh, I don't know about the military and what, what, whether there's any any role or you know value in that kind of collaboration. So that's a that's a high level generalization. I don't know. Um, yeah. yeah, one of the things Jordan, that I, I was going to say, Jordan sits, Jordan sits with one foot, you know, in and one foot out. Um, so she, she very cleverly got her company to uh, get out of paying for her tuition <laughs> in the program by getting an auditory scholarship. So she, she, really like started, she, started, she, started, she started off that job, you know. <laughs> um, but, uh, but that's an interesting one. The second front um, is, is, you know, one of the leaders at second front went through the training some time ago. He's out now and he's, you know, running a, a product team uh, and really looking at how we bring these methods into our team. Uh, what, we, what we found is that when we do work with the, in the um, defense space, it's always really beneficial to us to have somebody who's got you know real practical lived experience in that space because you need cultural interpretation as well as just acronym you know interpretation so you know somebody's got to do the translation <laughs> and and I, I can relate to something that I've done in my you know personal life or in my professional life in a corporate environment with a nonprofit I've never served in the military so I there's certain things where I just you know I need somebody like a Daniel saying well what Greg said, let me put it into a context that you're going to understand, right? Let me just say, I'm not the I'm not the ideal person to be translating things into military culture. Yeah, maybe Daniel was the wrong example. Maybe a I bit was of an, do that. <laughs> a bit of an outlier by nature. Yeah, 
Um, but you know, there are people like Jen Savada. There, there are a lot of people you find in the in the Defense Innovators Forum um, who have gone through this training. What we have found is you have a you have a very active and engaged community, right? And and um, that much more so than what we find in um, I'd say in, in on the civilian side. Uh, that, that you kind of find each other and you, and you keep supporting each other, uh, which is great. You know, that's, that's a really um, powerful thing. So we, 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 we find that very attractive and admire that about that, the community that you build um, of people who are trying to do this kind of work. So I think it's interesting that you mentioned that. I'm, I'm just going to jump in here because I was first introduced to Think Wrong by Jen Savada at that time. She was Colonel Savada working at AFA too. And, uh, it, she was actually my first unit commander in 2009. And, uh, but she introduced me to it and it was kind of revelatory, right? It was like a unique experience. It was a weird way of organizing people into these contexts where there was safety and there was, you know, we were like tricking our brains into doing things differently, like by circumventing the standard patterns, which is what you want in an ideal facilitated method, right? Is to create a space where the you're surmounting cognitive and social obstacles uh, to navigate complexity. And at that time, the only community of practice we had around it was just you knew people, right? Because it's kind of what you just hit on. Uh, Colonel Savada knew that that we at the at the 70th wing at the time would be uh, eager to kind of soak up these things. So we went to the three hour intro. And after that, it was like, oh, we need more of this we could use this as a tool to create those opportunities and environments in our workspace. But that's kind of the origin of uh, Agitare was this informal network, mostly existing uh, across the Defense Entrepreneurs Forum. Um, and it kind of brought to light this need for, well, what if we formalized the informal network, right? Um, I won't say it's entirely formal because it's weird to describe Agitare as formal. It's it's uh, it's very adaptive and organic, but um, but yeah. So Think Wrong has played a, a significant role in, you know, it was one of the first methodologies that we could be like, here's a system, right? And I I would like to dig in a little bit later to to what you referred to as creating systems of innovation because you do need those practitioners, those activated individuals, right? But without them having the opportunity to get energy from one another or bring others into the fold and, and like guide them along individual uh practitioners no matter how activated you know i experienced this uh will kind of flounder uh so you have to create a, a safe space for them and that's kind of the, the institutional systems that need to be created yeah and i think that's particular the institutional systems are particularly important in the military context because you have so much transition that happens and you know if you if we're talking about uh, a CEO who's going to be there for two years, and you know, as we say, it's three months getting up to speed and three months getting out. Then we got eighteen months of continuity, you know. And so the system is the thing that allows uh, allows for different people to transition in and out. And, and and what you find is a common language, a common set of frameworks, common understanding of the skills that are required to do the work, and a common toolkit. And if you have that, then you can have that flow. You can have people coming in and out. Now, priorities might shift. One CEO's priorities might be at different CEO's priorities. One CEO might be very concerned about performance, you know, optimization. Another one might be all about reinvention. That's fine. You can you can shift the you can shift your um, your resource if you have that same language and that same skill set. So I think that's what's important for you. And what you're and, and what something like Agitari actually provides is that platform for or disseminating that and, and uh, perpetuating, right? Yeah, I like, your, I like the, the idea of creating systems of innovation. And, but one of, the, one of the things, like I just wanted to go back to like the difference between industry and when we're talking about innovation in industry. And, and one of the things you brought up in, the, in that podcast was, was that, you know, when you have an industry that you're looking for profit, right? Where you, and you know when we had the shift in in COVID, that there's there's kind of this hemorrhaging of happening. And when you spoke about that, it really kind of made me think about well, in the defense space, we're not after profits. And so um, when you when you're talking about gaining returns on innovation, how that looks differently uh, in the defense space versus private industry, and um, 
and I'm just wondering how maybe from your perspective those things have have come to light in your yeah think wrong intensive or or just dealing with some customers yeah so I think I, I think that um, w- there's a there's a set of seven questions that we that we use that we call, call them the super seven they're really um, the, it's very determinant as, uh, as to whether or not you're going to have success um, in innovation. The first, the first question is, is there strategic fit? So within a military context, is this consistent with our mission, right? <laughs> is it, is the thing, uh, does it align to the mission that we have? Is there a portfolio fit? That says, are, you know, are we already doing, do we, are we already doing this in 10 different places? And is this just an 11th one? Or do we actually have a gap of space here? If there's 11 people trying to solve the same, you know, goal and, and, and executing the same strategy, 11 different teams, then you might want to be consolidating or, or collapsing because you're, you're, you're leaking capital, human capital in that case. Um, and then uh, we, there's a question, is it wanted? And is it wanted is, does it connect to a real, uh, a profound pain and problem or need, right? And so when we're looking at that, yes, it's consistent with our mission, so our goals and our strategies for executing that. We've got space, we should be doing this. Is there, is there a real, have we validated what the problem is and is that a strategically um, critical uh, need or, or um, problem to address? And uh, it doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter if it's a civilian or, or a military or any context, just, you know, we, all, we all feel pain, we all have problems that need to be solved. So you're prioritizing those. Um, is it doable? And is it doable? It isn't about how complex or difficult it is. It is, is it technically possible to do something about this? Like, can, is it within our means uh, with the addition of some uh, capacity, whether that's technology or funding or um, geography, whatever it is, is it, is it with, within our means to actually do something about this? Do we, do we believe that we can do it? Um, an example of that would be uh, Google when they started looking at autonomous vehicles. They, they, they had an early hypothesis that this was doable because they looked at the algorithms for um, uh, flight control systems and for, for landing uh, on autopilot, right? And they said, okay, the auto- autopilot works, it exists in the world. Can we get it into a small close quartered craft without, you know, and make it work? We'll find out. Um, so it was doable. Is it worth it is the next question. And this gets to the, um, this gets to the, uh, the, the question of value. So in the private sector, we often think about profit as being the primary motive. Uh, that's changing, right? There, you, you, can talk, you hear people talking about triple bottom line. And so they're thinking about, are there other um, things that we need to look at? We like to look at, um, at, at, think about value as being a currency and you can decide what the currency is. In the military, the currency is not dollars, it's something else, right? Peace, security, stability, lives, right? These are, these are things that, that, that you're worrying about. Um, and so when you start to establish, is it worth it? Then you just, just say, instead of, instead of doing it in dollars or euros, we're going to do it in lives, right? <laughs> That's going to be our denomination. And we're going to measure it in that. Um, so you can, you can still, uh, you can, you can, you can still uh, use that criteria and, and apply that criteria. It's just a, um, it's just a different, um, different currency. It's a different, different form of value, right? The other, since I gave you the, other, the the first five, I'll give you the other two uh, other two questions. One is, um, it, does it represent affordable loss? That is, as we to get from this the, the level of uncertainty that we have to greater certainty, to get more confident in our assumption that we're making about whether or not this can be done or not. It, the, whatever step we need to take, the small bet we need to make, the little experiment we need to run. Is, is the cost of that worth, uh, you know, is it something that we could, if we're wrong, we can afford to have spent it, right? So if you have to, if you're going to deploy, you know, uh, you know 10,000 troops to a location, you better be pretty certain about, what, you know, why you're doing that. As opposed to if I'm going to move 10 people to a location, I don't have to be quite as certain. There's a, the, the, the level of loss is, is much different, right, that we'd be talking about in that context. Um, so the, uh, that, that notion of, is there affordable loss with what we need to do in order to move this thing, uh, through in its development cycle. And the final one is, uh, is, is option value being created? Um, so as we come up with the solution, this is particularly important, uh, as you facilitate, 
which is everybody's familiar from their design thinking training and that sort of thing with the idea of um, divergence and convergence, that pattern of we're trying to create a whole bunch of possibilities and then we're gonna converge on those that we evaluate to have, be, have the greatest potential for success. Option value is what hap what's happening when you're, when you're diverging. You're creating many possibilities. And when you converge, you're narrowing that option set down. But if you narrow it down to one, you don't have any options. It's either that thing has to work or it doesn't, right? So having two, three, four solutions in play is always critical. So we go through the seven, the seven questions at every stage of development, at every step in multiple times within stages, we're asking those seven questions. The, the value question is the, is the one that you're, because you're, you're, you're getting at, which is how do, how do we measure value? Well, you, to, just to have an agreement at the beginning of what your currency is going to be for measuring value. That was a phenomenal answer. Thank you for uh, giving us those. Yeah, I'd like to go into now a little bit more on the, the wrong uh, experience and then get into kind of um, some of our community members experience with you in that process and um, educational experience. All right. Was there a question in there? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's talk think wrong. The actual, okay, so I know we, we are going to be reproducing this and offering this up uh, on YouTube and LinkedIn and stuff. So even though a lot of our members here today have yeah. been through the course. Yeah. Um, so uh, the, let me, let me uh, give you just a, a very basic description of, of thinking wrong. And that is um, that we, <laughs> what I have, the graphic I just put in back myself, this is looking at, there's a, we're, we, you know, Sorry, at any given moment, we find that we're on a predictable path. As we are, um, as we are uh, working as innovators, as we are working as people who are trying to create change in the world, we will. Um, we can sort of describe, hey, if nothing changes, we can tell you what it's going to be like. We just stay on this path. Any of us who are trying to lead some kind of change or are trying to forge a bold path, we're creating a we're creating a deflection point off of the status quo. So. Then in very basic terms, we're trying to go from the way things are to the way things that we believe think, the, the way that we believe things ought to be, right? We're going from an as is state to a to be state, the current state to the future state, status quo to something new, right? However you want to phrase that. And there are two major factors that um, inhibit our ability to do that, you know. Uh, let's see, if we're, since, since we've got a little, rather than just me talking constantly, um, I want you to throw into your chat, uh, what's it feel like whenever you've tried to lead that kind of change? So if you've tried to create change in the world, if you tried to go, you know, take a group, a team from the predictable path onto the bold path, what's that felt like? Go ahead and throw it in chat. I like pulling teeth, friction, lonely, yeah, struggle, okay, running a marathon with a rock in my shoe, <laughs> okay, or rocks for shoes. I feel like I have to prove something first, yeah. Paddling uphill resistance. So we, we, you know, I think we can all identify with that. That sort of okay, it's me against the world, and uh, and it feels like the world is winning half the time, right? At least half the time. And so the um, what what makes it particularly difficult is um, the way that our the first the first factor is how our brain works. So uh, the first sort of form of resistance that we encounter when we're trying to create a change is the uh, is a neurological uh, issue. It's it's how our brains function, and thank goodness our brains work this way. But but it, it can be problematic when you're trying to create something new. So what happens when we learn something is a, set, a synaptic connection is created, right? So I've learned something, I get a connection made in my brain. Now the more and more that that's reinforced, the the thicker you know, think about it as like the thicker that sort of set of synaptic connections become until I have a neural pathway in my brain for these things. And I, the example I like to use when I'm teaching a class often is, you know, I ask people, have you, have you ever had that experience of driving from work to home and you pull up in front of your house and you think, huh, I don't really remember the drive, right? You're so preoccupied. Your brain is so involved in these other things that you just got from work to home. This whatever that that commute pattern is that you're used to, that you don't have to process it. So your brain has said, you know what, 
we got this. Don't worry. You do what you're going to do. I'll get you home. <laughs> you're just driving along that neural pathway. So that's fantastic. What that means is that we do not have to relearn a whole bunch of things over and over again. If we had to, you know, just imagine if this morning to brush your teeth, you had to go online and you had to Google how to brush my teeth. Like, because I, I don't know, yesterday I knew, I know I got to do it. Yesterday I knew how to do it. I don't remember how to do it. And because no synaptic connections were created. So I got to Google it. I've got to learn. And every day you're going to brush your teeth, you're going to have to do that. It would be a horrifying way to live, right? We, how do we get dressed? How do we get out of the house? How do we find our way to work? How do we find our way home? How do we order lunch? How do we take a, you know, all these things are just synaptic connections that have been made, neural pathways that have been established, and we don't have to relearn them. Fantastic that our brain works that way. The problem is, hello? Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, the problem is uh, that... <laughs> that um, when we get handed a problem, we're halfway to an answer before we've actually thought about what the problem is because our brain's got us sliding down that neural pathway. So that's the first problem. Our brains are so efficient at this that we actually have to trick our brain into, into interrupting that cycle to generate new possibilities. The second thing is how we work, how, how we operate as groups of beings. So how cultures uh, work. And so you get a culture and I believe me, you know, in case it hasn't occurred to you, there is such a thing as a military culture. And there is actually an Air Force culture, and there is a Marine culture, and there is an Army culture, and there's a Navy culture, and I'm sure there's a Coast Guard culture, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and those cultures are uh, reinforced through a set of uh, beliefs, assumptions, and biases that get passed on. They get passed on from generation to generation, right? And what that does is it, it, it limits us from, um, it limits us from uh, doing certain things because we'll say, no, you can't do that here. That's not allowed here. That's not, that's not okay here, right? Uh, and, and I'm sure you've all felt this in different ways about what is acceptable and what is unacceptable. What is the norm and what is abnormal? So what happens anytime you depart from that predictable path, from the status quo, the way things are, anytime you depart from that, what you're doing is you're threatening the way things are. You're threatening the status quo. And the cultural response is to protect itself. And so the way that it protects itself is by pulling you back down to it, by saying, nope, what you're doing is weird, abnormal, strange, bizarre, can't do it, come back here, or cast you out, right? So cultures will cast people out. So as we're trying to, um, as we are trying to lead change, by definition, we're going from what's normal to something, we're proposing something abnormal, and we're often treated as such. And the, 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 um, the, there's a few examples that, that I'd give. You know, people like Elon Musk, who are held up as being incredibly innovative, also get a lot called a whole bunch of other things because they're constantly challenging the status quo. Um, a, a very, uh, you know, powerful example of it is, is Malala, the young, you know, woman who stood up for the education of women and, and that within her cultural context that was labeled her heresy and she ended up getting shot in the head. In another cultural context, she was held up as a hero and she was given the Nobel Peace Prize. Those are two cultural responses to the same person in the same action, right? So you just think about how culture can inhibit us and, um, and, and get, get in our way. So that I, I give you that explanation to say, our brains working the way that they work is thinking right. right? That's how our brain should work. That's good. And we're, and we're glad they work that way. Cultures working that way is in, in many cases very good. That's how cultures survive. It's how they thrive. It's how they protect themselves. And, 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 um, and passing on uh, uh, stories, passing on lore, passing on beliefs can be really powerful, but it can also be very limiting. And um, so, so if, if thinking right is, is, you know, this sort of the way that our, our biology works and the way that our culture works, then we need to trick both our brains and our communities into considering new possibilities, into generating new possibilities. So what we mean by thinking wrong is that ability to conquer both biology and culture to create something new. Right to to actually uh, uh, at least entertain and generate something new, and then you can evaluate and decide how to move it forward. 
but that's really the, at the heart of thinking wrong. It's, a, it's about overcoming those two things. That's amazing um, and great explanation. And, and so now I'm curious to go, now we understand that from some of our participants of the, of the last cohort, um, have you been able to utilize some of those skills that you learned in the Think Wrong intensive and, and has that helped you understand that deflection and, and friction that comes from that, from those cultural biases? And have you been able to navigate through that more efficiently after having attended? I guess I can go first. Um, so I, I would say definitely yes. And to to go back to around the time frame, I started looking into facilitation as a skill and something that people even do, like back back when Daniel was originally starting starting Agitare. Like I've I've gone through those mental growing pains at different stages over the past like year and a half, trying to even understand what what this is, and usually. Well, like before I started working at AFWorks, which is where I was at before I, I, I was at Second Front, which is where I am now, um, I attended a few different workshops that some of our team had hosted. And you just, at, at that point, you just go and you show up and you are guided through the entire workshop and you, you just kind of process it from the way you're intending to be guided through it. So you don't think about it as critically about how much work went into actually planning the entire event and trying to get certain outcomes from it. So it wasn't until I, I flipped that perspective and was like, oh, if, if I were to try and run one of these, like when, when would I do it? What exercises would I start using? And how, how would it actually go in real time that it started to become a real challenge? <laughs> and I, I like had a mental like, like click happen once I started trying different little exercises here and there. Um, but I didn't really know many of them until I took the think wrong intensive where I started to get like a common vocabulary going with, with our team at, at second front. And then of course with an agitare where I could share like in, in a random meeting, it would be faltering and we'd be having trouble coming to a conclusion. And we'd just be like, Oh, let's, let's try the um, matters most drill. Let's throw that up on the mirror board and just work, work this out. So I think from that perspective, uh, going through Think Wrong has, has helped me helped me immensely because it's put the vocabulary to the concepts that I kind of know and then be able to work through them with other people who understand the same methodology. I think you just hit on something really interesting, Jordan, which is I've heard some people say that good design, good facilitation is invisible. Actually, people do also say good design is invisible. That's why I said design. But um, <laughs> And, and I also see design and facilitation as closely related. But it, the, the aspect of people not actually knowing what they're, go, what they're experiencing when they're experiencing a well-facilitated experience is a significant uh, obstacle for us. And it's one reason that I started trying to draw attention to people, uh, paying attention to what they're experiencing when something is not well-facilitated. For example, imagine a staff meeting and I've been wanting to tackle the the military or the Air Force staff meeting for some time now because they make zero sense at all. They make zero sense. People will sit for an hour of just slideshows like with here are some numbers on the screen for the commander to be able to say the numbers were put in front of him at some point, but everybody's time is wasted. Nobody has the opportunity to speak up or say, yeah, this reflects my lived experience. But it the fact that that is uh, is a pointless experience is invisible to most of the people who are having it, which I think that what you just hit on is a really important thing for Agitari to try and understand is how do we make it visible? How do we make it undeniable that the old social technologies don't work? Like they don't accomplish what we say they're accomplishing. Yeah. Well, you, even what Greg, you, you did earlier in the call where you were like, have everybody type in the chat what what the challenge is or like how, how you perceive this, this problem. It's like doing that and thinking in the moment when you're presenting to a group of people to, to prompt them to provide input, like that's not something we naturally do. Like that's something you have to start thinking about in conversation and start making it a habit for yourself to, to break up the just like presentation style. So there are a lot of those things that I'm, I'm starting to recognize now and be able to step up and do because I've, I've had more, more formal training on it. Yeah. 
Yeah, let's hear from somebody else who just went through Think Wrong a little bit to reflect on what kind of their experience was gathering some of these uh, some of these big insights on and and how it's been applied yet. Yeah, and just so everybody knows, like the diversity just in that group, you know, Jordan Reserve Air Force now industry is AFWorks. I mean, and then you know Chloe, active duty Marine, also centers of adaptive war fighting. Philip up up in. Uh, Alice in Alaska, just doing some wonderful things up there. And, and Andrew, um, you know, now out there with the 101st Army, um, just a diverse group. And so when, Greg, when you're talking about the different cultures, uh, just within that group, I'm sure that a lot of those were highlighted. So please. Oh. Uh, Chloe's our first Marine. That's one reason, actually, I'm going to jump in. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's one reason I'm excited about Agitare yeah. playing this role with the scholarship is because, unfortunately, like the people who know the people aren't, it's going to be, it tended to be more Air Force, right? Because that's who we knew. We knew people within our network. Whereas Agitari, now that we kind of have this really extreme responsibility, we're kind of focused on how do we get it to not just the people we know who we, where we think it'll be impactful. How do we get it dispersed throughout the network? Because that's going to have the biggest impact. Yeah. All right, Chloe or Andrew, I think you were going to say something. Yeah, I, I'll go next. I, I, um, so I, I'm new to the community, to Agitari, to, to think wrong and, and, and facilitation, design thinking, all these things. So I, I was part of the problem for a really long time. I, I had no shortage of, of passion. I had no shortage of like, you know, balking the status quo, you know, and, and, um, and I wanted to do things differently and better. And, and, and with me, I'm, I'm very much a systems person and um, people who, who know me oftentimes, especially in communities like this, they say, oh, you're Lauren's husband. And I say, yeah, I'm, I'm Lauren's husband. You know, Lauren uh, Hanson Armendariz from Eagle Works at 101st. She and I um, work together where I'm, I'm usually more of, of a in the background kind of person. So things like this are, are, uh, you know, outside my comfort zone, but but in a good way, where I'm where I'm growing and, and learning. Um, but but I was working on a program, or a, 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 I was working on with mission mission command system interoperability. You know, I'm sitting down and I'm saying, hey, in order for me to do my job, this thing needs to talk to this thing, and and the army says it does, <laughs> the joint force says it does, but you know, these things aren't talking. But I, I'm. I'm going to get there. We are going to get there. And, and so I just started, you know, you ever play the game with the jigsaw where, you know, it's like there's water that goes through the tunnel and, and you got to move the jigsaw pieces to get the tunnel and the water to flow it was kind of like that. It was just, just threading, you know, all this stuff together to just try to say, okay, now we can talk here, but it wasn't a systems, you know, there were problems all over, right? We, the army says we have um, families of systems. And I, I tend to say, Hey, we have systems of problems or problems of systems. Right. And, um, so as I'm going through, I'm realizing it's, it's not really a systems problem. It's a human problem. It's, you know, we, you know, they reflect the way that we do business. And, and so I started kind of raising my hand and to anybody who would listen and say, Hey, we, we got to do it better. It needs to be better. We can do it. And, and I had a, excuse me, this phone never rings. So I'll just do that. But the, uh, so, so I said, you know, I was, I felt like in, in hindsight, I felt like chicken little, right? I was running around just like the sky's falling, the sky's falling and, and I don't know what to do. And around the same time, Lauren was, this is weird. Lauren was, um, it actually works better if you don't put it back on the receiver. No, I, I disconnected the lines. It's, <laughs> it's, it's one of the automated system things, but so anyways, around this time, Lauren was linked up with the Center for Adaptive Warfighting and, and with the CAW and, and with the community. And, and she said, well, let me help. I said, well, I, I don't know, you know, and, and so she did. She, she brought kind of uh, a community I, I brought together. We called the Message Council. It was just all the people across post that I was able to kind of pull in on, on MS teams. And, you know, previously where it was like, hey, I, you know, there's only one person who knows how to do that one thing. And then once you do that, you have to go talk to this other person who knows how to do that one thing. And it was a very inefficient process. So I brought all those people in and we started collaborating. Lauren grabbed us, that group together, and, and took us through uh, a, a session. And she was using words that I was, you know, it, it, was, it was a successful session. It was really great. But she was using words that like culturally, like I, I'd never heard ideate before, right? And I was like, what is ideating? I'm just going to come up with some stuff. And that's, that's what we do. Don't put me in a box. Stop trying to structure me. 
don't hey you know greg was saying earlier you know like don't don't dampen my creative process i'm an artist you know it's it very it was terrible but so down the line you know making you know making a lot of mistakes right but then uh rob montano from uh from the Ashtari community reached out to lauren and said hey i think you should you could really benefit from this think wrong intensive and you know, I, I really like what they're about. And, you know, there's a scholarship available. We want to get you in. Um, so I did. And I learned so much while I was in it. So much so that as, as I'm going back, I was like, holy cow, I can't believe I did this, this, this. But, but really, too, what I learned was innovation is not necessarily about, you know, shiny new objects or new tech or new things. It's, it's about transformation. And, and we need that. I serve in a, in a portion of the Army that is the you know, it's the mass market, it's the status quo by design. We, you know, the army says, hey, here's all your stuff, you know, use it, train with it and keep it ready from, from now until three years from now. And, you know, so status quo, don't change that. <laughs> uh, when we buy new stuff or, or there's new problems, we'll figure that out and we'll give you new stuff so that you can keep that ready and, and you know, and that's, that's a process, right? But so it's not just about, you know, shiny new tech, it's transformation. Transformation, I learned through Think Wrong, is, is, is about dissatisfaction with the status quo. It's, it's about a vision and a process. And if you have those three things, you can achieve that transformation. I, I, I had tons of dissatisfaction. I had tons of, of vision, at least I thought, right? Uh, I didn't have a process, right? And, and Greg and, and Mike and the rest of the team and, and all the members here, you know, just collaboratively kind of going through that process really helped out so i took away you know i more than you know more than my share of time to to express all of the things that i learned and what i was able to do but um you know one of the things in there is is you learn to recognize the roles right so you learn that that innovation has these outlaws you know you have you have sheriffs who who kind of you know i was i was an outlaw and, and outlaws don't like sheriffs right the, the sheriffs are sort of the <laughs> no order and discipline keep you know or, or you know just just keep it keep things the way they are right and and then you have you know sort of your advocates i was like lauren and and you have your executives you know you really need those executives to help um you know support these programs and, and we had that um so now though like going through this i i feel as though i've been able to transform from an outlaw to having that 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 process here at Eagle Works and 101st to being an advocate. And every single day, I'm using some tool that I picked up through through Think Wrong um, and, and really just, just through this community. And, and lastly, I'll, I'll wrap up with, you know, uh, Daniel, you know, I, I haven't been an active participant in the Agitari uh, community as much as I'd like to, but I'll tell you, you do a really great job of getting your vision out there. Right, getting the purpose and the support, and, and you know, and uh, the support network together, and why we do the things that we do, and that's been really so helpful to know that there's so many, so many others like like me, like us out there, and um, and I and I really appreciate what you know what, what you guys have put together here. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's, thanks for sharing. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, that's just really cool to hear the the kind of transformative aspects, that journey from, because I think that, unfortunately, you know, um, innovation is about uh, entering the adjacent possible, right? It's about identifying what the next, what the, what channel we could actually find our way through to an idealized future. It's not about identifying an idealized future and then transforming everything into that. And I see what you just described was an iterative journey from a, you know one state to another state which happened through a lot of serendipitous stuff right so i see the role of agitari and all of this as fast as facilitating more of that serendipity and part of that is is just sharing things sharing things maximizes entropy it creates you know the opportunity for serendipity because people can now encounter the things that are happening outside of their local sphere of influence right so yeah i i look forward to to uh to you being involved with with Agitari, because yeah, having more uh, wrong thinkers in the community is always a is always a plus. Thank you. No, I think we just have a couple more minutes with Greg. Uh, before you leave, Greg, uh, please thank you for for showing up and um, and uh, offer, allowing Agitari to be a part of your wonderful organization. 
Yeah, no, we're we're thrilled. Um, I will say, uh, Daniel took the intensive down in Austin, Texas, and um, uh, and Daniel, I hope you don't mind me sharing this, but uh, it was uh, aside from him being quite ill at the time, he struggled. He struggled. He he, he struggled and kept through and, and did the whole thing, even though um, he was feeling really poorly. I think I think worse than feeling uh, poorly physically, he was feeling. Um, uh, pretty much left alone uh, in terms of the work that he was trying to do. Uh, and what I, what, one of the things that's been remarkable is to see how he has persisted in an environment that's not always friendly to people who are trying to create change and who are trying to bring uh, creative thinking and innovation into it. Uh, and I think he's done it in a really masterful way. Uh, and I think that the, um, I think that this community is uh, is really um, going to provide opportunity for people like Daniel, who exist all over the military, uh, and and, and want to make a difference, and want to and want to drive change, and and want to uh, you know move things forward in a really constructive way. Um, so you know, I applaud you for creating the platform, for sharing the knowledge, for building the relationships. And for really being ambitious in how you're in how you're envisioning it, so you know it's it's super exciting for us, uh, and, and um, we're happy to be a part of it and to support in any way that we can. Wow, that's that's really incredible to hear from you, Greg. Uh, and I and I hugely appreciate you saying that. Um, yeah, I like to call Agitari a support group I created for myself, <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, in many ways, it is like people need support. They need human connection and other people to drag them forward. Also, to, for the crowd, though, if you haven't heard my interview with Greg that we did on the Agitari YouTube, it's like an hour and 50 minutes long, but the whole thing is just gold. It's so good. There's no uh, short conversation that involves me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think we maybe didn't like we're going to have to do a part two or something because we didn't cover everything we needed to in two hours. Yeah. All right. Um, thanks for having me. Enjoy the rest of the fishbowl, and uh, we'll, I, I'll look forward to seeing the the links out um, on social, so I can watch the rest of it. See you guys. Yeah. Thanks, thanks so much, Greg. 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 Thanks. All right. Hey, Philip. I'm glad it's getting light again. <laughs> Bye. I think that uh, Chloe was was about to share her experience going through the the Think Wrong uh, intensive. Oh, I can. I, I was more of her laughing at Andrew's phone and his, <laughs> his manner of dealing with it. Um, <laughs> no, I, so um, as, as most people are familiar, so uh, I was exposed to Think Wrong a few months ago, but I've been doing uh, kind of this kind of stuff work probably about the last five years or so. Um, my takeaway and the reason why I'm a big proponent of Think Wrong specifically is because a bullseye diagram is a bullseye diagram is a bullseye diagram. Whether you take it from Luma or 500 other people for whatever amount of money, ranging from $100 to 3500 $3, I think is the highest one. For me, as a, as a commonly used practitioner of design thinking techniques to get after everything from how to kill people better to how do I make checking into a unit easier, my takeaway is it flips that on its head and as for someone who routinely has to go divergent to convergent thinking, it's a completely different methodology of getting to the same objective, but it stretches my brain more. Um, and so for us, the Center for Adaptive Warfighting, we recognize we had confirmation bias coming into a problem framing se session, and we were introduced to think wrong because we were re-wickering the way that the CAW does certain things. And we knew that if we did a mountain, for those of you that have saved, ever taken our of courses, it would sink us too close to the thing we do all the time. And so for me, my takeaway and my advice and the reason why uh, when Agitar reached out to us and I was like, yep, throw my name in that at, um, is that it does force you to think differently um, in a completely unique way. Um, and that's that was my biggest takeaway. Uh, I use a lot of blended techniques um, for Macross and Macaw does. It's a compilation of about almost every services type of something. We, we stole something from everyone, um, but that's just, that, that's my takeaway.
Yeah, I consider myself pretty framework agnostic. Like, I think I, I totally agree with you. Most of these tools are basically just copies of each other, right, across these different frameworks. But um, yeah, I, I think it's interesting that you you kind of describe Think Wrong as particularly different. One aspect of it that it, that I think is unique is oftentimes when I'm using one of their methods, I don't immediately recognize it. I'm like, I don't really know where this is going, but it results in some really interesting ways of diverging. And add to that the fact that they they have like, I, I don't know at this point, a couple of hundred different drills to use. Um, the, and and using them has taught me to recognize what, like to be able to build my own actually. Um, more often than not, I create my own prompts for facilitated exercises, but I borrow significantly from things I learned, like with deliberate practice with the, you know, methods like think wrong. I'm interested, Philip, you've, you've had a, a very active journey, um, with Agitar. So I'm interested to hear from you kind of your experience and, uh, and maybe some current facilitations you've hosted. All right, so I jumped into the facilitation and design thinking process program, whatever you want to call it, in Agitara a year ago. So like I'm still new, still learning. And initially, like I went to a seminar with MITRE and learned a lot about Lotus Blossom and, and all that. And that's when I jumped in. And initially, like I since I've joined the military, like I, I can't stand accepting the status quo on anything. Like I it really bothers me when people are like, oh, you know, that's the way it is, or, you know, the, those routine phrases you always hear. Uh, but then I found with Think Wrong, like, I'm also, I, I am that person as well, without realizing it, that I've accepted the status quo. And one of those ways that we do it, we don't realize is not speaking up when we disagree. And that's what I appreciate with the Agitari community you know, after joining Agitare and like talking with uh, you, Daniel and Austin, like you guys always like encourage like, well, if you, if you don't agree or that encourage like healthy argument, right? Encourage healthy discussion because without it, you, we're not, we're staying on that status quo. We're staying on that bridge of that predicted path and we're not deflecting or we're not even possibly looking at another, another bold path. And Think Wrong, I, I learned the most from Think Wrong from the breakout groups and the small discussions, right? And as something that Greg pointed out too during, during Think Wrong was, was like in the in-person facilitation or in-person cohort that they normally do, you, um, you, you begin to pick up a lot from other people's groups, right? And I, it was still beneficial virtually like one of the main things that really stuck out to me was the Abilene par paradox, which is basically what I just hit on, right? Is is accepting accepting something the way it is because you don't want to disagree. And then versus like that one opportunity to possibly like, hey, you know, what if uh, Greg pointed it out and I use it a lot when you people, when you see people stay, stay on that, like, well, this is the answer to the problem. There's no other way. We need to throw more money at it or whatever. And then asking a simple question like, well, what is half of 13, right? And then everybody says 6.5, 6.5, 6.5. But then, you know, there's different ways to look at it. Is it one and three? Is it thir and teen? There's so many ways of looking at it that people are just accepting that routine path. Like, well, this is what it always is. This is how it is. And jumping into think wrong and how I've applied it now, so, like I said, I've been using a lot of a lot of tools from MITRE, but seeing people stuck in that stagnant, like, well, I've got no other way to look at it, and you know that quiet, like, like, well, I don't, I don't know what you want me to do, and then you're kind of like, as a facilitator, you're kind of like, well, I, I need people to speak up and and interact, and that's when I start using tools from Think Wrong, like, to help them interact and help them start to explore other 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 ideas. And it kind of forces creative thinking. That's what I really enjoyed about Think Wrong. Like it, people that aren't inherently creative or claim not to be, like it, it almost forces them to be creative. And yeah, we were, there's a, there's a few issues like here in Eielson, you know, being in the Arctic. And I'll, I'll give an example of one. Uh, it's, it's fairly simple, but it's, it's a, 
and it's not nothing simple it's a little complex but it's a nutrition problem on base right so like food food gets shipped up here in cold in, in arctic conditions or whatever right and it lasts about two days expiration date might be two weeks so that that applies to everywhere on base and then now you influx of personnel and etc like healthy eating people are kind of like lacking that there's not there's not very many options off base well what can we do to encourage that as well as encourage community growth you know people not staying locked up in their houses and, and getting out and doing things and so I we we took on this problem at the same time I started think wrong so I was like why not tie in a lot of the think wrong tools with this right and we're, we're coming to the end stages now where we we're actually developing or prototyping a solution and it's it's pretty ingenious and and it's it's awesome because some of these ideas were kicked around at the beginning, but not not as like creatively or not as an in depth. Like a, like a, an example of one of the solutions is like a solar power greenhouse, right? Because we have con, con, conceptual sunlight in the summer, but no sunlight in the winter. So what do we do about that? Well, we we actually have batteries that can withhold like a good charge throughout the summer and sustain throughout the winter. So that's just an example of something, but I, I, we used Think Wrong to develop this, this prototype. And so it's pretty cool. So. I think it's really interesting. You mentioned the, the Abilene paradox, uh, which if, if other people aren't familiar, I had to look it up myself, but it's the desire, it's the tendency for groups to come up with outcomes that they don't all actually agree with uh, because of the nature of, I mean, managing agreement and dissent seems to be one of the primary constraints is that people can't do. I've heard actually design thinking described as being iterative in nature. Like it has, there are practitioners out there who try and facilitate design thinking, you know, uh, to, to the extent that they understand, but they don't, re they don't result in solutions that are off the, away from the status quo far enough. Like they don't actually question the, you know, like, should we completely diverge off of, you know, what, what the direction or the mental models that we all have for what this system should be doing, for example. Whereas one of the interesting things, and I think it's going to be a tendency for anybody who tries to be a, a facilitator, they're going to, there's a really strong pull of the gravity of the status quo. And it's really difficult to know which tools to use to prevent, you know, the Abilene paradox or uh, to prevent ending up with solutions that just aren't bold enough. And uh, one of the unique things that I, I always thought was really weird about Think Wrong is how specific the exercises are. They're not general. They're very, they're, they, they, they point you in a really specific direction to think. And they're like, think about this in this specific way right now. And then in a second, we're gonna think of this other really specific way. Whereas a lot of other design thinking methods um, are much more generalized you know it's like you look at the you look at like uh, the iceberg model which is a, I'm a favorite example of mine of a of a useful tool but it also asks the participants to do deep analysis of a system that they might not be equipped to do so how do you get them to do deep analysis that they're not equipped to do you force them to think in things like metaphors for example that's a that's a really useful uh, method so yeah it's it is one of the more powerful things about it is how specific some of the exercises are. Yeah, I like Philip how you mentioned it being like a system of innovation. One of the things that Greg had brought up, and you know, with my experience from Agitari, and I've only been part of the community about a year now too, is you know, I've I've seen and Dan, we talked about this before. I've seen facilitations for uh, hosting DNI conversations, uh, strategic alignment events creating PME projections for Space Force uh, and, and, other, and other big projects. And one of the commonalities that you find, I think, especially when you're first starting out facilitation or first breaking the ice on that status quo uh, for an organization, bringing those tactics to the table um, and feeling that gravity is, is one, you're not creating those insights that are bold enough so people don't see the value and they just feel weird. And if you don't acknowledge that the feeling of feeling weird is actually meaning that we're getting there, right? Um, but also, 
if you're not creating enough full, or even I've, I've noticed it during a strategic alignment event where there was actual moments where insights were created that in my eyes was actionable, bold, and very impactful, but they sat on a board for over eight months and nothing was done about them. So it's, it's not only the facilitation, but then I think the value and something that the currency that Greg talked about is, is if there's, if that, if that didn't generate an actionable insight that actually people do something about, then it's only going to last as, as you know, with, with the people that enjoy the facilitation. Um, and so I think that there's, there's also a huge proportion of this that goes into, okay, how do we create lines of effort out of these things that are actually going to get done and to create more value for the facilitation? So Andrew, I think you had something to say, but I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I think one thing that's, you know, unique to, to think wrong is, is it really dials you into like a, an empathetic ecosystem, right? But, you know, so, that, so there's a ton of value in collective problem framing, but it's, you know, like getting everybody kind of on board um, early in the process, identify the problem collectively and not just kind of, you know, the military, we say, hey, here's your problem solve it, you know, and, and it has varying levels of success, but getting everybody in early, but then as you kind of walk the dog through the process, it's, it's, you know, uh, Greg showed the deflection point and that, and that, you know, the bold path and the predictable path. And, and, you know, the, the other piece of that is sort of the anchors and the rockets. And, and one of the things that was really helpful to go through and, and facilitate, uh, or, or in the intensive was, you know, don't just sort of think of, you know, overall, what is that one problem? Think about that problem within its ecosystem. You know, who, who are the constituents? Who does this problem apply to? You know, and, and then for each one of those constituents, you know, in, in the military, maybe there's a commander, there's a staff, there's a soldier, there's, you know, there's, or, or in, in industry, you know, hey, there's a, there's a customer, there's a producer, there's a, there's all these, you know, constituents that, that are in the ecosystem of, of, uh, or, you know, the space in which you're operating. And, Bringing all of them together, coming up with you know the 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 common predictable path that you know where everybody has thought of everyone else's sort of point of view, and then mapping out that bold path and that the anchors that are that are holding you down from getting there, and the rockets that can really sort of you know get it you know get you on that on that bold path was you know I found that unique and incredibly uh, helpful. Michael, you you went through Think Wrong when? When was it? Uh, it was uh, gonna. It must have been early. You know what? It was early 2020, um, before the before the pandemic kicked off. So that was uh, interesting. I was super excited to uh, kind of start digging in and practice facilitation, and then kind of you know March hit, and it was like no one go anywhere. Don't like, <laughs> like we're we're done seeing people. So. Uh, <laughs> So that was a uh, really interesting. How do we pivot to do um, this virtually? But you know, I luckily, uh, had a good group of folks uh, at my previous unit that were uh, had started down that path of of offering facilitated discovery sessions for for different units and had really kind of uh, kind of wet the appetite of of different leaders around the organization. So. Um, I had just finished my training and actually uh, got to lead a couple of a pretty big, um, awesome sessions with some folks. And, and, and one of the things that I really love is how, how kind of like doing this really feels inclusive to me. Every time I, I use Think Wrong Practices, um, any of the drills, uh, any, any of the sprints that I put together, I feel like it doesn't matter who I bring into the room they all feel like they have a voice at the end of the day. Um, and so no matter what, no matter what the decision is at the end, how, you know, how this journey plays out along the way uh, at the end, whoever was there, was a part of it, um, you know, feels like that they at least, they at least had their say, uh, they had input into it. They helped shape whatever the outcome is. Uh, and so that's a lot more meaningful. Um, leading these sessions uh, and kind of bringing people along the journey and showing them that, Hey, there's a way to do things differently and solve problems, um, you know, uniquely and, and fairly quickly is exciting, but I really like what um, Greg said about 
um, what they've been doing a lot these days is kind of helping uh, companies think about their systems of innovation and, and think about like their innovation portfolios and how do you actually manage those on a bigger level. Um, and that's one of the things that I'm, I'm kind of starting to see, especially in the, you know, uh, military, but, you know, across the national defense sectors, uh, we, we like systems, we like, you know, defined bounds and things like that. And we play really well within those. And so it, bringing, bringing innovation to leaders in those terms really helps them a lot. So, so when I bring something crazy, like, you know, some sort of think wrong drill, um, you know, they might feel uncomfortable, but if I can tell them, uh, you know, we're looking at this from a bigger picture and this is actually going to be a part of an innovation portfolio for you. How do we actually do that? And look at your, your, your system of innovation across the entire organization. And, you know, what things are we accelerating? What things are we actually really kind of breaking the mold on? And then what are some things that maybe we need to divest ourselves of? Um, so those are kind of a lot of things that um, I think wrong has helped me realize and bring to the table when I, when I talk to, you know, my leadership. Yeah. I like how you brought up the inclusion portion, especially when you're talking about the, like the tiers of the innovation system and, and who's actually having their finger on the pulse of the problem to actually who's managing the people or the system um, and able to uh, ensure that they're not putting too much pressure on things that don't matter and leaving room for exploration and leaving room for, for growth and opportunity and, and those um, transformations to happen. So um, well, that's really cool. So I think that like innovation and in, specifically in the military is, is twofold, right? There, I'm, I'm, I'm the world's worst person at flying a drone. I hate using a 3D printer. I don't particularly enjoy coding. I am all like fulfilling every, every stereotype of being a care eater for you guys. Like I got it. Um, but what I what the what a group like this, right? And every service has some some sort of organization. We all write collectively. Like I think some of you guys are in our Slack. We're in your Slack. Like it's all good. Um, is there's the innovators, right? The, the tactical level where people are actually solving their own problems, right? And then there's other individuals that are just enablers. I know a guy who knows a guy who knows this other guy and we'll like link you up and right. And that's how we're, we're generating at the grassroots level that cross functionality and in, in innovation and collaboration at, at the department of defense level, because instead of waiting for it to ascend to the 06 level into the general officer level for it to go all the way back down for me to talk to Andrew or Philip or Daniel or Jordan or any of the people on this um, call right now is like, I can just go directly to you now. I don't have to wait to like by chance, like walk into, like hope to God I leave Marine land and like walk into a fort or something like that. And so I think when you start talking about innovation within the, the DOD, it's, it's, I think it's two-sided in what your roles and responsibilities are. And I think people get that confused. They're like, I, I don't know how to code. I, how could I possibly innovate, right? To Andrew's point about the shiny new object. And you don't have to, you can just be like, I'm an enabler because I, I can't do any of the rest of this stuff and I don't want to. I just want to help other people solve this problem. And I think that's what the larger roles are as you start to go down the innovation path and you stay within the community for a certain amount of time. One, because you start volunteering yourself, yourself up for things that are not inherently the thing you started doing. And now we've come down to a path where it's all about enabling the level because we now know we're so far removed from being able to make the widgets or code the thing or all these other things because we're chained to our out, Outlook inbox just that this is the more important discussion. Um, I think as you continue, not so much at the front end, but as you continue through your journey in this field, yeah, I was. I appreciate that idea of there being different roles, and I, I like how I like how Think Wrong they uh, they organize it. Right, they've got the different roles for innovation and the enablers and the people who are maybe enemies to innovation or the antibodies within an organization. Um, I've this has been on my mind a lot recently. I was on a call with uh, Michael recently uh, talking about the potential for using maturity models as a way of examining, and, and I posted something on LinkedIn that was about Rita McGrath's innovation maturity model, which 
is a way of diagnosing where you are, like your organization. What's our current capacity for innovation? Is the is the institution itself friendly to innovation, or is it primarily driven by kind of the rebels or the uh, insurgents? So I think that there's two things to look at, right? Because the you know Thinkrong does a good job of activating insurgent facilitators, those people who can make things happen within their immediate sphere of influence, however small that might be. Uh, but then there's also what the institution can do to make those kinds of things happen so that like lower the threshold for uh, for those spaces to be created or for those opportunities to be created. I think it ties in to a lot to, you know, Cus mentioned that sometimes you'll run a facilitated session, you'll come up with these really insightful outputs and it'll sit there for eight months. Well, that's clearly an institutional problem. It's that you whatever you did in that session is is not friendly or accepted enough by the institution, which means that as a facilitator, you should be considering what is the actual outcome of this experience? Are we just going to give people an experience? Which I are I would argue that's actually a beneficial thing because everybody gets the opportunity to be heard, right? There's catharsis involved. There's uh, there's cultural alignment involved. This is why I think you should do retrospectives, even if you don't end up with action items. But um, I'm sort of here, curious to hear from the group with all of that. I'm going to stop ranting. Um, Having been through this and kind of, you know, being activated on this particular, I mean, you were all basically fairly activated before you went into the think wrong route. But I'm sort of curious where you see yourself at in your organization and what you think is next for your particular organization. Or maybe you don't know and you're a bit at a loss and it's something for Agitari to consider how we can better enable you, right? Because it's, it's something that I'm I'm not just interested in helping people have the ability to create spaces and make things happen for people. I'm also interested in those being fruitful within your context. So sort of curious if anybody has any thoughts on what, have you thought about what's next? How are you going to change your organization to uh, minimize the number of antibodies or whatever it needs to happen? So I'll answer that, Daniel. Um, Shout out to Chloe. Like we're we're going to we're looking at getting Kala set up here and at Ielson to help influence that that change. You know our like brothers and sisters down at Jaber have just bedded down Kala for the Arctic, and we're, now we're looking at Kala for the Arctic North. You know just to help influence more ways of thinking and innovation within within our base. Because like like you said like we've talked about it before, there's a frozen middle, but there's also a frozen top where there's no movement because, you know, we've got no additional push to make something happen. Like we know what needs to happen, but there's no additional push that needs to happen vetting in from, from senior leaders or, or a frozen middle. And I think, I think influencing like opportunities like Ka, Think Wrong, Agitari, like all of those will help build that, you know, it, it, in turn, what, what happens is I think it becomes a status quo. Now this is, oh, this is the route we take. This is what happens. So. I do really like that prompt, Daniel, because I, I go back and forth between like what I can do in the guard with my limited time when I'm just there <laughs> two, two days a month and then two weeks of the year. And like, Want, wanting to do some things and I've, I've run one session one weekend in our public affairs shop to generate ideas on writing articles but like outside of that it's it's tough to actually apply much of anything because I'm not the one that's there full time so it, it is a good prompt to think about what more I could do and maybe like like work with other offices in in the unit and like position myself to be somebody who wants to help with that every drill weekend might might be something like that but I know in um, in the startup world, it's completely different. It's like we're not struggling to change in like these these structures that are in place, and like everybody's resistant to changing. It's it's actually trying to add a little bit more discipline, I would say, in making sure that we're setting out up the foundation that is going to. Uh, put, point us in the direction that we want to go over the long term. And that's been a completely different change in perspective for me and, and how you can employ these different methodologies to, to support that instead. 
And it's more about getting people on the same page so that we're all consistently in the same direction. Um, yeah, it's it's been pretty cool. Yeah, the guard, I feel for you, I've been running, I've done a couple of sessions for guard troops. Uh, and I am like, I'm at a loss, honestly, with the uh, amount of participation they have with their institution, they have so little opportunity to affect change. Like it's just, it's so minimal. Like, and the amount of space that they have uh, is really only enough to be, meet the bare minimum of what's being asked of them. I'd encourage you, uh, I mean, with the guard specifically, I think there are some organizations, I mean, I know that like ARC Works is, uh, you know, Bobby Carbonell and, and them are doing some cool things. Um, but I know that they struggle with the resourcing piece. It's just, it's so challenging. Um, but it is interesting that you're now looking at it from both sides, the military and the startup side. I think that could result in you having some really interesting insights as you kind of pick that apart. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's been a lot of a lot of interesting things to come out of it, yeah, even outside of facilitation and just being able to use any tool I want for technology for the most part. And then I'm like, oh, this is a whole nother problem. <laughs> it's not about getting access to tools. It's having so many to choose from and now I have to evaluate them. And yeah, so yeah, interesting. Too, too much structure is definitely a bad thing, but too little is also can create chaos. Yep. Yeah, Chloe, I really, go ahead. Back. No, I was just gonna echo a little bit of Jordan, you know, that prompt has really made me think while you guys were discussing just from a personal perspective, like, um, you know, what I plan to do, I'm about to transition from my wonderful position out here in Spain to, sitting next close to Michael Harbin at AFPC. And it's got me thinking about how I want that transition, that new role that I'm assuming, what sort of environment and culture and, and language do I wanna to bring to that new environment? And how, um, you know, as I'm getting more and more um, fluent with these practices, what I've noticed that's worked in, that's worked well in practice on very technical problems is, is not overthinking. You know, sometimes you don't need a full facilitation to, you know, engage those biases from with these social technology tools. Um, you know, like I was, I was prototyping a solar power generator the other day and we, and I just grabbed some stickies and we started throwing stickies on the generator itself, you know? So little things like that, where, you know, I, as I'm preparing for this new transition, just having more tools, I just feel more prepared to bring that culture with me, bring the vocabulary with me. And, and I think that, you know, in the military, you get a good opportunity when you do PCS or you do change stations um, where you can kind of start, you know, from the onset, you've, you've kind of created that environment around yourself. And then, so I'm really excited um, that I've been able to just learn so much from this community and I'm looking forward to that transition because I feel like it's just going to raise the level of, of my foundation a little bit higher. Um, and so I'm excited about that. So I'll go next. Um, I, I think uh, it's a great question. I appreciate the prompt. You know, that I work a lot with Eagle Works with, with Lauren, and, but, you know, Eagle Works is a startup. You know, it's, it's a very lean startup, right? Like we, we had, uh, we were very fortunate. We had a great executive, you know, that, um, you know, Colonel, Colonel John Cogdo, he's the uh, chief of staff now for 18th Airborne Corps. Um, but, but he, he had a vision. He, he had, you know, the, the placement, the access, the resources, the materials, and, and the support uh, for, for what we are and, and what we've been able to become. Um, but Lauren and I really only have a year left here, right? You know, the army and the military, we, we move each other you know, all over the place. And we, we had this thing called the, you know, sustainable readiness model, you know, and, and, and I and they say, oh yeah, you know, you just sustained readiness in this band of excellence. Sometimes you'll be good. Sometimes you'll not be so good, but you'll always be excellent. And I call that the band of mediocrity. And I think Kim Jong-un actually came up with the sustainable readiness model because as soon as you start doing something great, you know, they pluck all the people that, you know, away and, but anyways, so we got about a year left here and, and I'm transitioning into a, a, a company command role, which um, I've been told by people um, with much higher rank than me, um, you know, within my, my field of intelligence, like, hey, 
you're doing a lot with innovation. You're doing a lot of extracurricular type stuff. But once you get into command, like you should stop all that stuff. You stop, stop playing around and, 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 and just get to managing people and property and, and, and stuff like and reporting the news, you know, just the statistics in the news. And, and I, you know, of course, always thank them for their perspective and, and kind of, you know, walked out there trying to really evaluate, like, what would cause someone who I consider successful in this, in this career field or, or these people who are successful to, to disassociate innovation with, with command and leadership? You know, what kind of culture really, you know, do we have that you can't be innovative if you're, if you're a leader? Because if I think if we can crack that nut, we can really, you know, spread the web a bit, you know? Um, so as, as I go into command, I'm, I'm going through these, these inventories of all the equipment. I'm just sort of getting to know the folks that I'm going to be uh, working with. And, and I was kind of explaining, you know, because he asked, why do you have a, you know, I have like a satchel, right? And he's like, why, why do you have a, a satchel? And, and I said, uh, I said, well, I'm always working an angle, right? I've always got an initiative and, and inside this satchel, I, I have material that I can pull out at any time and, and show pictures and, and um, you know, and, and really help <laughs> spread the word, but, uh, and he's like, well, what's going to happen when you go into command? You know, are you still going to be spreading the word? Are you still going to be working all these things? I, I said, well, first and foremost, you know, I'm gonna wrap my head around the new problem set, you know, and I, I think there are some tools that, that I've gotten through, through Think Wrong that um, I, I don't think we have to wait 30 days for me to learn everything about everything here before I can do anything, right? I, I think we can come up with a sprint um, where very quickly I can, you know, you guys can onboard me and, and then I can, I can kind of uh, be in a, in a position that's um, better suited to, to move forward faster, you know, start, you know, uh, who says it, it's, you know, start small, scale fast, and what do they say, you know, um, anyways, I'm, I'm butchering that, but, you know, start small and, and scale fast, right, but uh, think big, start small, scale fast, anyways, before I leave here, you know, if there is one coder, you know, on an army system that's that's coding in the Eagle Works Artifactory, right? That's the name I, I kind of came up for because we're going to contribute to software artifacts, um, you know, within you know the you know a, a DoD uh, kind of GitHub you know repository, right? If there's one soldier doing that, if there's if there's one soldier with a Raspberry Pi, like learning you know, or, or, a, or an NVIDIA Jetson that's like learning how this stuff actually works and, and demystifying AI and image recognition and, um, and things like that. And, and can kind of just get, have a space to get in and, and, and then tell somebody about it, right? Like, hey, look what I learned. I, I've connected with this community that, that, because there's so many people out there with all these little projects that um, you could, you know, get into the environment on the, you know, keyboard, video, mouse, get in there, do the things that they're saying, learn a little bit about it. Now this robot's like, you know, guiding itself along the floor. Like that's, that's not crazy. Um, but if we have a place for that, um, I, I think we're, you know, I think we're doing all right by the time we leave. And, and if I think we've sort of uh, created something where it doesn't need us, it doesn't need our personality, it doesn't need our charisma to, or, or my lack thereof, right? It doesn't need any of that it just works um, and, and it continues, then, then we're doing all right. I, you know, nobody cares who gets the credit. Nobody cares that, that, you know, how great we did while we were here. What we care is, is how do we, how do we bake in the change? How do we bake in the transformation and, and not just continuous integration or continuous development of, of software, right? But of people, of organizations, that's, that's kind of what, what we're going for. As an indicator, last point, you know, when people, pull things off the share drive that are like interesting. Cause I always put like really, you know, I plant things on the share. Hey, have you seen this for architecture or whatever? And I love it when they send me a product that I made, you know, and they're like, have you seen this? And it's like a year or two years, three years down, down the, down the line to me. I'm like, no, but this is really great. <laughs> you know, I, I love that you're using it right? because it's, it's not about us. It's about what can we make endure longer than us? So. I hope that's where we go.
Yeah, no, those are some really interesting insights, it especially kind of peaked my ears when you talk about, you know, you're going into a command role and people are saying now it's time to leave the innovation stuff behind. Well, the most activated I've ever been was when an 06 was on my team. Like it, it's, it is because they could provide the top cover because they could create the space. That's why I'm in the role that I'm in now where I'm focusing on this stuff full time. That's why I was able to focus on it full time when I was at the 70th wing, because we had a wing commander who was creating that space to happen. I do also have a criticism of that, which is that just creating a space is often not enough because as a senior leader, you also, you own the operating system of that organization. And the operating system uses a type of social technology, which means that if they are at scale, not engaging in reflective practices, the, who owns that? The command owns that because they're the ones who set the tone for here is what we are expected to get, at, to get out of the social technology that we employ. And I've been actually urging senior leaders now to think about what do you do at your meetings? How often do you have meetings where you actually create psychological safety for your subordinates where they would actually tell you the truth? Because I think that a majority of people at 05 and above almost maybe never a majority of them are never in a room with people who feel safe enough to be honest with them. That's been my experience, at least. It doesn't happen in staff, in any staff meeting I've ever been in. People aren't honest because they're not. And that's like base level. This is what facilitation is about. It's about creating space for people to, to actually say, my lived experience is this. And here is whether it is the, the existing system is coherent with that or not. Like that's, you know, that's what, the uh, deflection point anchors and rockets is right. That's the bit. That's the first move you learn in, in think wrong. It's just creating space where people can say, here's what is, here's what could be like, here's what I want to be. And then here's what's holding us back and what could get us there. Right. And you could do that with a meeting. You could, so that's what I'd say, like, you know, to anybody who says command has no role in innovation, they set the tone, like they own the operating system. And that determines whether this is a flash in a pan in a room or a lab somewhere, or it becomes so infused within the organization that now we have an appetite for it and we're not going to accept anything less. So that's my view on that. But if that's a criticism, I mean, keep them coming. I'm fired up, right? <laughs> I, I, Count me in. I'm on the team. No, and I, I, I completely <laughs> agree with Dan. You know, there's, there's, there's a difference between just holding space and then actually doing something about it. And that, I think, when, when you can embed it into, you know, creating psychological safety from the start in a staff meeting, that is, seems to me like the easiest way to begin breaking the mold. And then, and then as you move further into that, you can dive deeper. Uh, one of the things that I will note is that um, when you do these design efforts, oftentimes if, if the participants in your unit, uh, if you're trying something, you're trying to create a, a culture of innovation uh, as a command using these practices, sometimes those, those weird moments, those deep reflections, those, those scabs that you begin to pick are very personable. They're very, very personal. And if you didn't do the, the due diligence of creating that psychological safety, then you run the risk of, of really offending that person and having them have a negative reaction to that facilitation and, um, and feeling almost used um, as like a test subject um, because they're, they, they leave confused when they should have left curious. Um, and then they feel used instead of being felt a part of something that they've contributed. And I've noticed that a few times happen where, you know, design sprints happen quickly. People's understanding of the, the, the process that are being utilized are different. And you really have to have the empathy from the, the lowest perspective in the room, not lowest, not being um, just being the person that doesn't, hasn't been awarded the opportunity to, to learn and grow and be part of some of these facilitated practices. And so um, bye Jordan. Yeah, we're going to wrap up soon, but um, Andrew, I, I look forward to for your involvement in Agitari and, and hopefully you can, uh, as a commander, if that's what you call it in the army, uh, <laughs> um, is. It, is, to, is to just lean in um, and be sneaky, create that psychological safety and, um, and be, be the one that uh, 
that is willing to just break that mold for sure. But be careful with it, you know, be diligent. And yeah, I, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think uh, that's what I look, one of the things I look forward to most, right. Is, is just, you know, um, creating the psychological space where people can, can say like, what might happen when, you know, when, when a soldier, you know, just get, catches wind of, Oh, wow. You know, it, this is okay. Well, now I want to say this thing. And, and maybe there's this one thing that, and, and now there's somebody else that can grab that. And there's just so much synergy that can really happen with, you know, we have such diversity in our ranks, you know, uh, across, you know, all spectrums of, of backgrounds and cultures and, and everything, and bringing them together through a common purpose and vision of not only just what we're expected to do, right, to foot the bill for, for army readiness, right, but to push the envelope. So I, I really look forward to that. And, um, and, and, and showing that, that command and innovation are, are not exclusive. Well, I think we're, we're about 11 minutes over. Um, so excited for you, um, Andrew, to be here uh, with us, but also learning, growing, um, going into the position you are. Philip, you've been such a, a great member of the community. So thanks for being part of this. And, and Michael, a co-host, and Dan, what can we say? Thanks for creating this space. Clint, I don't know if you're still listening, but I appreciate you sticking around. <laughs> and, yeah, I'm uh, still I'm still here, man. Well, you you wanna say hi or <laughs> I, yeah, um, I, I just have been sitting back just kind of gleaning off of y'all's wisdom. I'm uh, I'm I'm jealous to be honest. Um, getting to listen to some of these initiatives and some of the things you guys are working towards and the uh, intentionality that you have. Uh, I work for FEMA, and we certainly could uh, use a, a healthy dose of innovation in our sector, um, but I've really just been kind of sitting back and just just listening, and uh, here lately, I haven't really had much time to get on to Slack or, or really be a part of the community, but any chance I get, I'm, I'm grateful for, so thank you, guys. Man, thanks for that. It's such a, a cool perspective to know that we got... Um, you here with us and and that you think uh, those wonderful things about us. Um, I just put into the chat um, a survey. So Andrew, Clint, Philip, um, if you have a chance to fill that out, this is just a survey that tells us how this event goes. Um, we didn't have um, made some last minute planning, but what we'd like to do is improve this this um, event. So if you have any feedback, please give it there. Other than that, I appreciate everybody being here. And uh, yeah, thanks so much, Cus and Michael for putting this thing on and for everybody for showing up and, and giving your, you know, your testimony. I really appreciate uh, everything you all are doing. You're keeping things driving forward, uh, which makes my job a whole lot easier because I can just kind of show up and enjoy it sometimes. And that means a huge amount to me. So thanks really a lot, uh, Cousin Michael, specifically for this one, for the fishbowl. I have reached out to Raja Shar to see if she'd be interested in hosting a talk in June about speculative design. Really excited about that. And we've got, uh, you know, no end of great resources in the community. Clint, if you're not already in the, uh, if you're not already in our Slack, which I couldn't find you in our Slack, so I'm just gonna put the link in the chat. Uh, there's there's a dedicated agitatory Slack for exploring these kind of things. So thanks thanks again, cousin Michael, for, for putting the work in. Yeah, My pleasure. Stay, stay tuned. Nate Schwegler is on next month from the Joint Special Operations University, so that should be a good one. So make sure uh, you're there for that one.